The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. ACI web sessions are recorded at ACI conventions or other concrete industry events and will be made available for viewing free of charge for one week. Thereafter, they will be archived on the ACI website or added to ACI's online CEU program depending on their content. Uh, yeah, I'm here today at the uh, field development of PE in three states. Uh, we have plants both in Iowa and Oklahoma. I currently reside in the Oklahoma plant. My talk today is basically on high strength uh, reinforcement uh, for uh, worldwide reinforcement for high strength concrete products. Overview today, I'll give you a brief history of high strength reinforcement. I want to show you how it's made. Um, I have a little video clip of part of that. And, and then why is there a recent need or interest? in high strength um, reinforcing material products. What are, the de what are some details we use our high strength uh, local water reinforcement in, uh, in products? And where are we headed um, with uh, high strength local water reinforcement? Brief history here. First patent we ever used uh, for welded wire fabric, as it was called back then, or welded wire reinforcement, as we like to term it today, were back in 1901. Mass production probably didn't start until about 1908 or any commercial product but the patents were actually issued in 1901. Extensive use of uh, building floor systems in many of the skyscrapers uh, throughout the country were in the mid-1920s, 1930s, 1940s to help uh, expedite and thin up the slabs because uh, they could be draped over top and bottom, positive moment steel throughout the building slab. Much of the uh, building of the interstate in the 1950s and 60s also helped advance the, the, the issues of using welded wire reinforcement in those uh, paving products. Uh, and in, in uh, 1950s and 60s, because of the interstate uh, interest, there began to be some uh, research and testing on higher strength reinforcement where that could go. And then uh, first appeared in the code, I believe, 1977, uh, based upon the research that was done. PCI, I think there was two or three other papers and, and other research products that were uh, companies that did research on the wire. Uh, put it in, and also it, it entered the ASTM code standards, I believe, in the 1970s, uh, or late 70s, early 80s. Uh, how is it made? We can get, when we produce the rod, I'll show you that, when we produce our rod, we can get multiple grades on one, one rod. It depends on how much you draw it down. So the more, the more cold working we do, the more drawing of the, of the product, the, the higher the strength, the smaller the area, uh, we can get more use out of the product. We're really only limited, our manufacturing uh, is really limited by our manufacturer, how much, uh, how, how the machine can actually, how much coal work can we can actually do on the rod, uh, and how much that drawdown. Uh, that could be anywhere from 20 to 50 percent. Usually we're in the, the lower range, 25 to 30 percent. Uh, typically, uh, so we got to pick the rod, we pick the chemistry, and then we draw it down. I want to show you how this is made from a video here is supposed to pull up uh, the rolling of the actual rod, but I can't seem to. Anyhow, what this, uh, I can explain the video if I can't actually go. Well, what the video shows is that uh, we, uh, in, our, in our rolling mill, we have a hot, hot, roll, hot roll product put in the oven, heat it up, send it down the line. Uh, the, the steel itself, we, we pass those as well, but I want to show you how it was made and rolled out into a particular rod. And so it starts with a square ingot, 35 feet, 40 feet long, heats it up, so it's malleable, so when you draw it out, there are about 25 different machines that take the size of this thing as it goes. It goes from the oven to the end of the line in, in a coil of a couple hundred feet long in a matter of two minutes, two, two minutes and 30 seconds, depending on the size of the rod at the end. So it starts at about a five inch square, six inch square, 35 feet long, ends up about a quarter, quarter size or smaller, uh, four, uh, 400 to 500 feet long in a coil. And then we run those coils and we ship it out. This is a plot. You notice this is a typical steel curve. What you normally get for any steel curve, that's what we get out of that process of rolling. So we get a particular size, quarter size, on and on smaller. Uh, and what we tend to do then, if we want higher strength, is we draw that in some equipment. So with the same size rod, we'll get different grades depending on how much we want to work it uh, and draw it down. 
but that's also based on the chemistry of the rod, which we need to talk about as well. So this this plot actually shows up well here. I may take a five in, a five eighths inch rod. I'll still I may use it at a sixty grade, or I may take a five inch rod and draw it down, and actually get an eighty grade rod out of that same out of that same rod material. Now the material I'm using uh, based on chem rod chemistry. I have certain designations here that tell me the chemistry I have to use. I'll show a table later of all the uh, a lot of the, the high high strength reinforcing products that we have in one of our documents that we have published under the 439 committee. So, coal working or drawing down. Uh, it, the strength that we get out of it depends on the rod chemistry, uh, the rod size, and then the amount of work we put into the rod. Uh, where are the limits? We're, we're after looking at high strength. Where are the limits for rod? We're in the current, uh, we're in the current testing, but we have in our plant, we, we are, are our, our set of companies, we you know have a market market group share that somebody draws down our high our high strength barbed wire. But our high strength barbed wire is between 150 and 170 ksi. This is just the material grade, the steel material grade we use. Uh, some of the plants that, that work with water also can do a, a strand in a higher strength. Again, it depends on the chemistry of the rod you want to get to that strength. So what chemistry you, you design into that uh, depends on product line you're going to, and we'll get into that as well. So comparing product, product chemistry, that's important in reinforcing products. There could be a vast difference in those chemistries, even sometimes between individual bar grades. I mean, there's usually a spec for the bar chemistry. It usually average, but when you actually pick a certain bar, they'll actually give you, in a, in a mill cert, they'll actually give you what the chemistry is. It usually falls within certain parameters or ranges. So between bar sizes and the joint or, or rod sizes, there may be a slight different chemistry. We use Ten oh eight. If we're not going to draw it down that much, which is a particular chemistry, all the way up to a ten twenty six, which is a, a little bit different chemistry mix. If you want to draw it down a lot, now that's the high end of what we use. And I just showed you the ten forty five for a very high strength product and a high strength bob, bob water thing. Uh, we have this report out. It says steel report a report of steel reinforcing material properties and U.S. availability. Um, after we get through the current code cycles and the two documents we got in our committee. Up to tack and have and have reviews coming back to us. We need to take this this reference, and I think we need to update it. The last date we did, I think it was 09. Uh, I think it was published in uh, mid 90s and reviewed uh, 10 years later, 2005, or started to be reviewed. It was pub last published in 09, and there's been a lot of changes in research done since then. And so I think after we get through with this thing, we need to take a look at that. I'll have to put a proposal up to the committee, and make sure everyone's aware. But I think we should take a, another look at this document and, and do some reviews. Uh, there is the document. It's about 20, 26, 30 pages, something like that, in between there. Uh, that's, that's the title blown up so you can see it. That's, that's uh, available for purchase. You see our website, downloadable, uh, however you want to do that. That actually gives all the properties of the height of, of reinforcing materials that you can put in concrete in the North American market. To give a summary of them, and what we're what we're doing right now is essentially taking some of those materials out and doing individual reports to show you how you can uh, use them better in concrete products. Uh, wire is being one, uh, and then that steel is another, and there may be other needs needs for the particular product line. And this is really what this is really all the uh, here is this is really all the product lines that are discussed in that in that reference. That's the reference. So we've got we've got the, the, the grade, the regular bar, the two grade, two grades of bar, multiple grade, and the original grade with certain strength in that thing. And these may change because there's research that's been done for all of these that are changing, as well as we are in the process of doing more research for wire and where we can go with the high strength. Uh, again, here's MFX bar, here's strand, and you'll notice this is just a smattering of, of, of potential chemistry you might see amongst those different products. Whether it's high strength or whether you're going to go to, uh, you know, a, a 60 grade steel base, and I, I, I kind of want to put something like this in the table to summarize it because it's kind of scattered throughout the document as well. I might put this in there, hopefully in an appendix or something just to give you an idea. Not all not all reinforcing materials are made alike. They're all for a particular purpose, uh, and, and a lot of that is based on the chemistry, which I didn't have time really to look at the details of what the grades and callouts were. But they each have a call out as well in the international type market, and they all have ASDM 
uh, designations as well, which you can actually track. And there's multiple ones for strand. So those need to be looked at in terms of what the strand use is going to be used for. Okay, why is there a need? Why is there a need or interest for high strength reinforcing materials? Well, because there's high strength mix designs now. If you've attended any of these sessions over the years, you'll notice that back in the 1950s and 60s, you may be maxed out five or six KSI is your high strength. Uh, throughout the 1980s, I think we, pushed, we were pushing 10,000 or more. Uh, now, it's high strength is over 20. In fact, you've got normal weight, 10 to 10, 3 to 10. High strength concrete, about 10 to 20. And you've got this uh, new, new product, relatively new, in the last 16 years or so, ultra-high performance concrete, which 20 to 40. I've even been in a session that said somebody got 42 KSI. And I, if, if, you were, if you heard my prior presentation on leveraging technology, this, this seemed more like a skill. And I said that, that the way the current history, if you follow and track history, uh, concrete is trying to do what steel did, iron, iron ore, or raw iron, at the turn of the last century, is replace it as a primary building material in all, in all facets of, of, of the phases of our lives and infrastructure and building construction. And so there's a lot more need for the higher strength material reinforcements because of these high strength uh, products that are coming out with those higher strength concretes. Uh, the other thing I also learned too at one of the conventions is when you start working with, and I think Adam alluded to it, when you start working with the high strength products on both ends, concrete and steel, there is still a limit threshold. Uh, I'm not surprised at that. The limit threshold, and really with the, the analysis and the research that's been done, you can probably go back and find it amongst the ACI documents, is it, it's the concrete interlock. It's the concrete aggregate interlock that gives you a threshold. So you, you have to come back from that so you don't get a brittle failure in using both materials together. And there is research out there for that. And that's, uh, that was, to me, a good, good point of reference to understand there's still a threshold we need to use as engineers to pull it back from that threshold. Also, a need, there's, there's greater load resistance and service load conditions because of the higher strength concretes we're using. And there's more emphasis now on performance, resiliency of the product, life cycle cost analysis, um, and, and service and maintenance. This is often referred to in the industry as, as you want to build, you want to build more green, you want to build more sustainable, resilient product. And there's also a need to reduce congestion in critical sections. Uh, you can do that with high strength uh, products because you can reduce the you can reduce the section of the steel by up to 25 percent or more, depending on the strength you use. So you can actually go 40 percent if you use 100 KSI up to 80. Or if you use an 80, it's about 25, 20, 25 percent. So that that reduce, can reduce a lot of your congestion, allowing concrete to flow better in your material or the product that you're that you're casting or pouring for. How is high strength welded wire helpful? Well, we can make prefabricated cages. Uh, it, well, most of it may come in, in flat sheets, but we can bend it to a, a parameters that you might want, either for on-site construction or a quick assembly in a precast yard. Uh, we can develop high strength. We're in, like I said, we're in testing right now. We're trying to analysis of where that strength limit can be, how far we can go with it. Uh, we can reduce that congestion, the congestion, uh, and relieve some of those tight areas of congestion. There's also some design aids that we are that we have on our on the Wire Reinforcing Organization Institute. If you want to copy it down, hold it there for a moment. And some of those we are now working with to, to update to the current codes and standards. Uh, and so uh, you can get them. It may only be referenced to the previous codes a little bit, but we are in the process of, of updating those. If you want, uh, if you want acknowledgement or you want to be able to be you know reviewing some of that we can actually if you want to give me your car later we can actually keep you in touch when you review those to make sure that it's, it's current acceptable in the industry some of that stuff we are trying to get a census of some of the documents we are actually trying to put up on that website details uh, we can use a lot in transportation different products precast beams uh, precast elements beams tees box curtains uh, box beams piers foundation sections if you want to precast something and you want to be able to put it together quickly, we can help you with that, even high strength, regular strength or high strength. We can work with that. A lot of times we might need to have a little bit of lead time of what you're needed for because uh, there's a lot of construction projects, there's a lot of lead time scheduling. We need to be able to have time to be able to get the wire ready, to put it on a machine, to weld it up, make the configuration you need, bent, flat, whatever. We need to drop it in place and pass the board. Again, retaining walls and abutments, I've done some of those. Precast, cast in place uh, segments, uh, and then concrete paving sections, or uh, for transportation, box and uh, box covers, reinforced concrete box covers, reinforced concrete pipe, 
we do a lot of work with those manufacturers. Some cast in place, mostly free cast. Here's some examples for you. Again, on the other right, you've got a typical barrier uh, a beam, beam, a Texas stop, I think this is a text stop beam. You've got parking garage, a lot of these are precast component structures. You've got a column mass going in, which the outer cage is uh, Water Reinforcement Institute. We often help build stadium risers uh, in, in all types of stadiums. And this is a nice long, as you can tell, uh, specially designed beam to go a transportation product. We put a lot of our, uh, a lot of materials into the, the webs and the, and the flanges. This is a, a slide I like because they're pouring, they're trying to pour a quick, a quick thing here, a quick pour high strength uh, thing of, of a slab on a deck um, because it needs to be rehabbed. They throw in a piece of, uh, uh, they throw in this, hopefully, preferably with chairs. I think they're trying to pour it with a, just a, a general lay down of concrete, put this on top. You can do that with why we recommend chariot though. Uh, but for a quick pour and a high strength pour uh, to get in and get out as, as everybody wants to do now. You can use our product to lay it down quickly. This is a slide I like because there's a lot of products. We're putting high strength uh, reinforcement in these types of panel, face panels. We're putting some in the slabs and the different precast panels. We're putting some in the beams. We can put it in the abutment in the, in the, in the wing walls uh, and even in the foundations. Uh, a lot of DOTs don't allow it in the barrier rail because that's the only product here that really you don't see a high strength product that coming on the market. Okay, buildings. We can also precast some of that same stuff that we do in transportation buildings to help uh, parking garages mainly, but uh, floor slab type things. You want to precast it, prefab it, put it in place, uh, double T's, columns, you know, the retaining walls that we need for grades around buildings. Uh, MSC walls is a big thing we've got. We can do high strength with that. Precast panels, either structural panels on the face of the building or just a facing mock-up for the, for the exterior that looks, looks good. We can help precasters do that. Uh, with different, different mock-ups and different grades and, and strength of steel. Tilt-up panels is another uh, area. The thing with tilt-up panels, you need to be consistent in your reinforcement so we can run uh, one product multiple times, consistent pattern, and you have to cut out your holes. You can do that on site and you tilt up and cast the product. Cast in place, foundation, slabs on deck, elevated slab. If you're using a higher strength concrete and you want a higher strength steel, we can help provide that in the so you just give us the notice to be able to run it. Uh, or give it in a specification when it's ordered. Here's some building examples. We've got uh, flooring, uh, warehouse warehouse product, warehouse flooring here, stadium risers again. This is uh, sound wall panels uh, and, and, and various components we see here. Uh, we can make, make these uh, tees. You, we can put all the reinforcement in there in a higher strength product. So this can be essentially high strength, high rise, so to speak, with uh, high strength concrete and high straight steel. Okay, where are we headed? We're, we're in, the, in the process of, limit of testing for the higher limits. Where are we, get, where are we headed? Where are we going? Where can we go? Can we make a hundred? Do we have, how do we have to quantify that? Let's put it in the code. Uh, we're updating currently our, some of our design aids again. Um, soon to be published is a wire guide, 439, design, construction, and manufacture, how we make it so you can understand the process of uh, how you order and get it. And then we have uh, currently, we have wire specifications in ASTM. The four prior ones are, have been archived for 18 months, I believe, or more. Uh, they're no longer sold. And all these the four prior ones, 82, 8185, 496, 497 with ASTM now, have all, excuse me, have all been put into this 1064. Uh, we are currently in the process of discussing the same process doing it with Ash, but Ash, I think, has a, as well as four, and they're trying, we're trying to consolidate them as well into to getting on one standard. Summary and conclusions here. Well, the wire fabric or rolled wire reinforcement has been around over 110 years. The high strength, great, up to and about grade 80, a little over 50 maybe right now, in terms of the re from the research point when we started. It can be used in many products to expedite the process uh, or kind of delivery of that product or the site. Begin, we're beginning to test the limits of where we can go with different chemistries and different, uh, different types. We're currently also continuing to update the codes to current standards and, and, and research. Um, and we're, we're currently working on assisting the design aid. So if any of you have interest in the, uh, in the design process or interest in some of those uh, references and standards, Feel free to talk to me afterwards. 
and we can discuss how you can help help us reduce some of those documents to better make, to make them better for industry use. And with that, I'll ask for any questions. Yes. yes. Can you shed the light on uh, the recycled bonds? In old building, when you demolish them, you take that. In some countries, I don't know about here. Right, right. You, you take the, rest, the old uh, bars and they re reproduce them again. Re recycling the content of buildings, the, the steel content. The steel bars. Steel bars. Right. Okay. They reproduce them. Now, what will happen if they are grade 60, for example? Will they, can they produce higher grade from them? Or what is the stat What happens to that to the wire when it is reproduced again? So you're asking, you're asking if we, if we if we if we want to recycle the uh -huh. the steel, pull it out. I believe we, we can. We may have to see. What the, the the issue is is that the certain the bar that you pull out may have certain chemistries, chemistry properties, um, and you may have to test those chemistry properties in your in your melting process. In other words, you put it in the melting process. You you, you want to have a certain certain end result. And so you have to be able to make the end result work, not necessarily what you throw in the pot. And so if you want to melt that down, you may have to add a couple more components because now you want to get a higher grade out of that. If you add the right components, I believe you can still get that, that right product that you're shooting for, but it's, it's a matter of testing in that, in that melting process and getting the right chemistry to work. So that, that's really, the, I mean, to me, that's really part of the exciting part about all this stuff and what we've got the guide, that guide for, that report for, is on all these different products we can use. You can recycle any of those. The problem is you still have to work with the chemistry and make sure the chemistry and the end product comes out right. You know what? Because they came from another country. They come from other yeah, countries. We were there with you as you, you recycle them. <laughs> Sorry. You recycle them locally, for example. Yes. In the Middle East. Well, we can. They come from Turkey, from uh, Europe. Exactly. And they reproduce them again in another country. Right. right. We, we can take that. Yeah. The same factory. Well, we can take that. It's not a problem. We we've got we 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 have water and, and dealt with materials from all over the world. In our our plant in Oklahoma. What I'm saying is, if we want to melt that down, we still have to almost we still have to know what the, maybe the beginning chemistry was, but we can test it before we add anything to it. But we're still looking at the end result of what the chemistry we want to get out of that product is, and that's why sometimes a lot of our plants we need a chemist, we need a metallurgist, be able to make sure our testing facility that's adequate to be able to test that end product, so we can get the right product out of it. So that's a good question. Very good question. What is the largest size of the wire on the end? Yeah, before we can go up to a five, roughly a five eighths inch bar to form or wire to form, uh, and we deform that in the process. So most of the rods you see, that's what I want to show, are smooth coming out of the, the rods. And we'll, when we when we get an order for a product, we'll actually deform it as we draw it. So if we if it needs to be deformed, and so that's put into the uh, deformation when it's when it's, when it's cold work. Any relationship with these we call the Bigfoot mesh? Yes, we do that all the time. Yeah, the Bigfoot, Bigfoot mesh is, is really something you can step through without having to move. Yeah, I, I've done that up to up to the five eighths inch bar. I, I prefer if I want to replace something of a uh, number eight to twelve. I've done that before with the shorter you know shorter spaces. Um, uh, foundation equipment mats. I've designed some of those mainly in the plants where we now have the mill. Uh, we want to re replace it with our product because. We don't have to have to outsource from the eight bar. We want to use our own mats. And so I designed the, the mats that went into some of the equipment foundations um, 10, 12 years ago. Um, sure. Thank you very much. <laughs>